all. This is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So today we're going to continue our discussion about autonomic nervous system. I wanted to discuss the um, autonomic nervous system related injuries and pathologies. And I thought it was important to understand the vagus nerve and its function before we can go into the dysfunctions. So vagus nerve or the 10th cranial nerve, because it comes out of the uh, the brain matter and it is actually a nerve and mostly for head and neck area, but vagus nerve goes everywhere. Vagus nerve is called vagus because it means in Latin wandering. It goes everywhere in our um, starting from the head all the way down in the uh, abdomen, abdomen and to various viscera. So it's a wandering nerve. It is the most complex nerve of the autonomic nervous system. It is also the longest nerve out of all the cranial nerves. So with this, let's start our discussion. The structure that we are going to do is this. Let me give you a very quick summary of how it works. And that should be sufficient to understand the abnormalities. I'm going to go in the technical parts of it as well today. So the basic idea is that the vagus nerve has multiple components, but basically two type of components, sensory components that will bring the sensation to the vagus nuclei in the brainstem. And then some of those sensations will go to the higher centers as well. Many of the sensations that are brought in by vagus nerve are actually not for the conscious processing. These are for the subconscious processing of the visceral reflexes, for example, blood pressure maintenance and so on. Peristalsis, um, movement of the stomach, secretions of the various um, juices in the intestine, etc. Then vagus also brings motor activity. Motor activity means it brings messages to the muscles of, for example, intestine. Or it can bring messages to various uh, glands of the GIT system, even the respiratory system, and make them secrete, make them work. So that is the basic two main functions. Vagus also works with the visceral reflexes. What does that mean if the blood pressure goes up? The vagus nerve can help reduce the heart rate, and that is a reflex. Similarly, vagus can work with the reflex with the, uh, with the GIT, for example, in case of some irritant or food in the GIT, vagus nerve can reflexively help us to increase secretions and movement of the GIT. Vagus does have some somatic sensation as well. Somatic sensation means that sen sensation that comes from the body and not the visceras. Visceras are esophagus, stomach, intestine, liver, pancreas, and so on. The remaining body is soma. So somatic sensation, vagus actually brings somatic sensation from the back of the ear from the external auditory canal, that is this ear canal that we can see from outside, and even the sensation from the outside covering of the tympanic membrane or the ear drum. That is very important to keep in mind. In addition to that, vagus can carry some taste fibers from the back of the pharynx. So, from epiglottis. Epiglottis is a little structure here in the throat area where it kind of um, guides the food not to go into the airways. So epiglottis kind of work there as a valve and epiglottis has some covering which can do some rudimentary taste. Similarly, the posterior walls of the pharynx, pharynx is this area that also does some taste and that taste is actually felt by or carried by vagus nerve. So these are the general um, functions of vagus. We are going to go into detail of those functions part by part of the vagus nerve. So let's start. So today is an interesting day. Today is February 22. 2022. 
it is a Tuesday and today is also the day today is Tuesday or Tuesday as well. So welcome to the Humanities Coffee Shop. Let's start our discussion. Vagus nerve, 10th cranial nerve. It is actually two nerves, right and left. However, we, are, we collectively call them vagus nerve. It is called a wandering nerve. So here is this nerve and wandering about everywhere in our systems. And in that process, it innervates the um, heart and the lungs and the GIT or gastrointestinal tract, including liver, pancreas, um, muscles of the gut and so on. Now, this is it. The summary is done. I'll give you just one more part of the summary. So if you wanted to stop after that, you could. What are the components of the vagus and what are their general functions? So there are sensory components. Sensory components will be the one that are bringing sensation from bodies and tissue towards the brain. So these are called efferents, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, efferents. So if you see here, there are three kinds of sensory parts of the vagus. General, visceral, efferent, and I'll explain. Special, visceral, efferent. General, somatic, efferent. For the summary part of it, general, visceral, efferent are bringing in sensation which would help for example maintain blood pressure from the aortic arch and I have those drawn later on so I don't want to spend too much time here but blood pressure maintenance is a part of the vagus nerve so when vagus nerve is malfunctioning blood pressure maintenance heart rate maintenance can become um, incorrect then special visceral efferent Again, these are all afferent. They are sensory. They're bringing the information to us. Taste, as I said, from epiglottis and the posterior wall of the pharynx. Oxygen levels. For example, when, the, when we are not breathing correctly and carbon dioxide is increasing and the pH of the, uh, of the blood system start reducing or blood starts becoming acidic, vagus, a part of the vagus can help sense that and then try to correct the respiration and so on. General somatic afferent. So this is the body's sensation, pain, temperature, touch, pressure. Vagus is actually supposed to be a parasympathetic system, nerve. It should not be doing somatic work, but it does. And that is very, very tiny work. And that is, as I said before, the pain, temperature, touch, pressure on the back of the ear, in the ear canal and the eardrums outer side. So these are the sens sensory parts. Motor parts are general visceral efferent. So they're all efferents. Efferents means going outwards from the brain towards the viscera. Viscera being stomach and esophagus and pancreas and liver and intestine and so on. General visceral efferents. So these are simple messages to the viscera, for example. Message to the stomach to increase the peristalsis or to reduce it. Message to the intestine to increase or decrease peristalsis or movement of the intestine. Message to the glands of the intestine to increase or reduce the secretions of this. Normally when vagus is stimulated, that would cause increased secretion because parasympathetic system, if you remember, is for rest and digest. So when we have eaten something, we would increase the movement of our GIT, plus we would increase secretions in the GIT so we can mix those secretions with the food and kind of digest and absorb the food. So these messages are going to the GIT through vagus. So once again, keep in mind, if the vagus is malfunctioning, then the secretions of the GIT, the motility of the GIT, uh, that would also mean the feelings when the motility is abnormal, we can start feeling nausea and so on. Vagus itself doesn't create nausea, but Vagus can cause 
effect that would create nausea. Then is the special visceral efferent. So these are, for example, the um, muscles that are in the head area or the this head and neck area that were developed from fourth, fifth bronchial arches. So these are structures in embryo when the baby is being made inside the mother. The in the head region there are certain structures which we say bronchial arches, fourth, fifth bronchial arches, and the muscles that develop from there. Majority of those muscles are supplied by vagus. Example will be, for example, soft palate muscles. Over here, these are for fourth. So this is it. If you just wanted to hear what vagus does, this is the this is a summary. Now I'm going to go into detail, technical detail. This will be useful as well with the pathology and management even in the long COVID, but this is now the detail part. So for the detail, to start with, first of all, we have to realize that the vagus has its nuclei. Nuclei means a collection of the nerve cell bodies present within the brain, but separated from the main collection of the gray matter. So we call them nuclei, little islands of these nerve cell bodies. So we are here, this is medulla oblongata, or if I quickly make the structure. So let's say this is a spinal cord. When spinal cord goes up, it first becomes continuous with medulla oblongata, a structure in the brain stem. Then is pons. Then above that is midbrain. And then above that is the thalami, hypothalamus, subthalamus, thalamus. Those guys are there. And then above that, the limbic system is there, internal capsule and stuff. And then the main brain is there. So this part, this whole thing, medulla, oblongata, pons, and midbrain. They together make brain stem. Brain stem, or the part that is somewhere over here. Uh, I mean, it's not exactly here. It's uh, if my foramen magnum, if my skull ends here, then the brain stem is going to be sitting somewhere over here. So it is this part of the brain that is connecting the brain to the spinal cord. The brain stem and these structures here. They have vital centers in them. Our respiration is controlled here, and vagus has, a, has a, a part to play there. Our heart rate is controlled here, and vagus has a part to play there. Our temperature is controlled here, which vagus does not have a part. Our pH, our motility of the GIT, so many things are controlled by the nuclei or the collection of nerve cell bodies that are present in the brain stem. This is why if a person's brain stem gets damaged, usually it becomes very difficult to recover from that. So here, the discussion that we are doing today, this is the discussion that involves kind of parts of the medulla oblongata. So this part is called medulla oblongata. And we are talking about this one. So we are talking about nuclei or the collection of nerve cell bodies that are present here. So I have a cross section of medulla oblongata. This is the front part of it. These, for the healthcare professional students, they know this is pyramids. Pyramids are the motor fibers. When the brain, so right now I am speaking and I am moving my body and I'm animated and I'm, you know, I am animating as well. So those messages to the muscles are going from the brain to the muscles. So those wires, the message carrying nerves, make a track here, which is called pyramidal structure because that track, the bulge of that track in this area of the brain looks like a pyramid when you see it from outside. 
So we say this is pyramidal tract. This is also called a motor tract. But again, I'm not going to go into the detail of the whole cross-section of medulla oblongata. Just know this, that there is a pyramidal tract. Then next to that is a nucleus called ol olive. Again, we're not concerned with that. We are concerned with these three areas here, mainly. This nucleus or collection of nerve cell bodies is called nucleus ambiguous. And remember, these are present on both sides. So for us, just generally, there is a nucleus ambiguous present in medulla oblongata. On the back side, we say near the floor of the fourth ventricle. Fourth ventricle, so I think that will become too much at this time. Let's just say on the floor of the fourth ventricle or this open area, relatively open area of the medulla oblongata on the back side of the medulla, there are collection of neurons which are called, if you see here, this one, the blue one, outside one, is called solitary nucleus. And then this one, the red one, on the medial side, medial side means towards the inner side, is called dorsal motor nucleus. Dorsal means something on the back. Motor means something that would go and help move the muscles or bring orders to various glands to make them secrete. And nucleus means collection of nerve cell bodies. So nucleus ambiguous, solitary nucleus, and dorsal motor nucleus. There are some parts from the trigeminal nerve as well. We will look at them, but these are the main to keep in mind. Now, let's see how do they work, various parts. So now we're going to go... Just like wiring, we're going to see connections of vagus nerve and the functions. Imagine when we talk about pathology, if this function is disrupted, if this connection is disrupted, what symptoms can occur? So I'm really preparing ourselves from the ground up. So first of all, this is the SVE, special visceral efferent. Efferent will mean messages going from the central part of the brain or the nuclei of the vagus nerve to the viscera, to the viscera meaning esophagus or stomach and intestine, pancreas and so on. So how does this work? Here is the nucleus ambiguous. The nerves start from nucleus ambiguous they go ventrolaterally. Ventrolateral means they, they go outwards, outwards, and anteriorly. They come out of the medulla, then they go through the jugular foramen, and they come out of the skull. When they come out of the skull, they supply, this is, the word, this is a term we use, supplying. A nerve supplies various parts of our body. So we'll, when the nerve goes and relays on some part of the body, we'll say it supplies there. So here the nerve has come out. This is part of the vagus nerve. This is not the whole of it. There are, as you saw, five parts of the vagus. We're looking at one part now. That one part is starting from the nucleus ambiguous, comes out. Then look at this. It is the special visceral efferent. It is a special nerve. It is visceral, that means it goes to various visceras, and it is an efferent, that is, it is motor. So look what it is doing. It divides into various branches, and it supplies, look at this part first. It supplies as a pharyngeal nerve. This part is pharynx. So the nerves mostly that are coming in here, they give off branches that are pharyngeal or the nerve is pharyngeal. So here we have a vagus nerve that is giving a branch called pharyngeal nerve. That pharyngeal nerve is supplying the soft palate, some of the muscles there, plus it is supplying some of the muscle with the pharynx as well. Then it also makes another branch which is called superior laryngeal nerve and it supplies structures and muscles in the laryngeal area, larynx area. Then it makes another nerve which is a very famous and popular nerve called recurrent laryngeal nerve. Sometimes people who may have 
carcinomas of the lung or people who may have a problem with thyroid gland or some people who may have a problem with their um, aortic system or in the chest, they might get hoarseness of voice because the recurrent laryngeal nerve goes down and comes back up and supplies parts of the muscles that are helping with the speech. And if any of those structures on the way of recurrent, it, this nerve is called recurrent because it means it goes down and comes back up. It makes a loop. So in medical terms, when something makes a loop, we call it recurrent. So it is a recurrent laryngeal nerve and it can get trapped on the way of its journey. And then we can develop hoarseness of voice. So these are visceral, special visceral efferent. If you see, these are really the muscles of speech and vocalization. And these are the muscles that are from bronchial arch number four and five. What is the takeaway over here? Takeaway is very simple. You are looking at a component of vagus nerve that helps take part or that takes part in speech. And it offers innervation to various muscles of soft palate, pharynx, and laryngeal area. That's a takeaway. What does that mean then? If vagus nerve is not working correctly, and if this branch, this part of the vagus nerve is not working correctly, then that means we can have a problem with the speech. We may even have a problem with the breathing correctly. So, one part done. Special visceral efferent done. Next. And I thought I had one more over here. Yes, here it is. I think this is a copy of that one. Now, the second part is general visceral efferent. General, it's not special. Visceral, that means it goes to viscera. Efferent, outward going. These are, this would be, for example, to move the stomach or to move the intestine. This would be general visceral efferent, you know, just going to the muscles of the viscera or, or the glands of the viscera and make them secrete. Nothing special. This is just vagus nerves function. So the nucleus for this one is, you see here, dorsal motor nucleus. Why is it called motor nucleus? Remember, this is an efferent. Efferent means going outwards. Most of the time when the nerve is bringing signals outward, it will bring it to a muscle and moving a muscle is called a motor activity. This is why many of the motor, many times the motor word is used for nerves that bring action to the muscles or the nuclei that when excited produce activity of the muscle. Even in the brain, that area of the brain that helps us move, that area is called motor area. So dorsal motor nucleus gives this part of the vagus nerve. This is a general visceral efferent. Now this part gets out of the, again, the brain stem and then the brain. And what does it do? Look at this. It creates, now remember this is parasympathetic system. Remember we did this in autonomic nervous system that sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers that are getting out they usually relay in a ganglion. That means there are two nerves that are involved in bringing a message from the brain to a muscle or a gland. Fiber 1 and fiber 2, or preganglionic fiber and postganglionic fiber. So the fiber, and remember we also talked in autonomic nervous system that in the parasympathetic system that we're talking today, the preganglionic fibers are long. Post-ganglionic fibers are usually small. Normally, the ganglion or the relay is on the, on the viscera, on the intestine, on the liver, on the spleen, on the pancreas, on the stomach. And then a tiny, small second neuron will go to the viscera itself. So these fibers that are coming in, they will be called pre-ganglionic fiber. They're the first neuron starting from the brain or brain stem and going towards the viscera. But before it goes and ends on the viscera, it has to stop. It has to make a ganglion 
then the second part would actually go to the viscera. Many times these ganglions are situated on the tissue, for example, on the lungs, on the trachea, on the heart, on the stomach, on the GAT. Parasympathetic preganglionic long, postganglionic short, ganglions normally present on or near the viscera. So here, preganglionic fibers are coming out. What are they doing? They're going to bring activity for visceral actions. These are the actions that are not in your control. They are out of your control. They are autonomic and they are parasympathetic. That is their rest and digest. So you don't even know and they are helping your body move the muscles, GIT, and, and do the secretions. So look at this. You see the branches here going to trachea, tracheal muscles. Then branches going to lungs, so secretions in the lungs. Then branches, this is very important. And nowadays with the long COVID, you might actually hear people saying my heart rate goes up and down. One of the reasons can be, this is not the only reason, but one of the reasons. Vagus nerves arrives at the heart. It stops. Then the second neuron goes to the SA node. So in the heart, if I can, in the heart, where the superior vena cava or where the blood enters the heart from the upper part, near that opening is the sinoatrial node or the automatic natural pacemaker of the heart. Vagus nerve can influence that pacemaker and reduce the heart rate. You can also see that if Vagus starts misfiring, then heart rate can go up just like a wire which causes short circuiting. And sometimes it is connected and sometimes it is not. And sometimes it's working and sometimes it is not. And the bulbs that are attached to that wiring are just flickering. Same way, if there is a problem with the vagal activity, heart rate could go up and down. Why? Our natural heart rate without the parasympathetic system, that is vagus signals, is usually at 120. So that means if you cut the vagus on a heart and let the heart beat by itself under sympathetic system, for example, it will maintain 120 beats per minute. Vagus or parasympathetic system's function is to keep that heart rate low and bring it down to 70 to 80. Now think about it for a second. You stop the signal in vagus for a few seconds. The heart rate would go up because that is heart's natural activity. Then you send the signal from Vegas and heart rate would go down. And if you send too much signal from Vegas, heart rate would go below the normal. So there could be an arrhythmia. I don't want to call it arrhythmia, but afibrillations, atrial fibrillations could occur or arrhythmias could occur or just generally the heart rate could become abnormal. That is this circuit. What is this circuit? This is the general visceral efferent coming from the dorsal motor nucleus in medulla oblongata and bringing messages to the heart. Similarly, there are messages that are brought to kidneys. There are messages that are brought to esophagus, stomach, intestine, not the whole of it. Small intestine and the um, medical professionals, medical students, nursing students who might know this, will know this, that our gut is made from three parts, right? We say foregut, midgut, and hindgut. Vagus nerve supplies areas that are developed from the foregut and midgut. So when the baby is being developed, those parts of the intestine that take shape from foregut and midgut, they are supplied by vagus. Hindgut parts are not. So that means vagus can supply up to the splenic flexure of the large intestine. So esophagus, stomach, duodenum, small intestine, ileum, jejunum, jejunum, ileum, then ascending colon, then transverse colon, up to the splenic flexure and stop. In addition to that, it supplies spleen and stomach's glands and the liver and pancreas. This is the main big supply. This is what we, when we say vagus, these are the functions that normally we 
mean? And so what are the functions here? For example, there can be secretions of bronchi. So the, the airway secretions can increase. So think about it. If vagus is not working correctly, we might actually get abnormal secretions in our airways. We might get stomach churning. We might get pancreatic juices. We might get intestinal movements or abnormalities in them, which might result in diarrhea, which might result in pain, which might result in nausea. Depends how intense is the abnormality. So this one, once again, general visceral efferent starts all the way from trachea and covers majority of the visceras of our body. Okay, continuing. Next part, general visceral efferent. So these efferents were signals going from the brain stem outwards toward the viscera commanding them to do things commanding the muscles to move or commanding the um, glands to secrete here now and one uh, for medical uh, medicos here <laughs> vagus does not order the suprarenal glands activity it doesn't go there that is primarily under sympathetic control Okay, so here, general visceral efferent. So now we are talking about signals that are carried on the vagus wire nerve and brought back towards our brain, towards our brain stem. Now, please keep in mind, there are going to be many signals that we would not even be aware of. For example, if I said to you right now that are you aware that your heart is moving or your lungs are moving or your GIT is moving or your system is secreting various juices or, or um, various enzymes or are you aware that your body is right now judging the blood pressure and then bringing that message through the vagus to the brain stem and then responding and trying to increase or decrease heart rate and change the blood vessel uh, you know diameters you're not majority of those reflexes are not at a conscious level these are maintained or created by vagus's involvement so now we're talking about sensation which we may not be consciously aware of but they still are sensations in our autonomic part and the subconscious system or unconscious system or autonomic part is taking care of all of that so let's see how does it work. General visceral afferent. This is going to be fibers coming back. So if you see here, this is the dorsal nucleus. If fibers, I have put arrows on them. They actually, the previous branches that we just saw, which are bringing messages to viscera, the same nerve pathways have branches that are bringing signal back but not exactly the same nerve. There are just sensory nerves combined with those motor nerves as well. They, they are traveling alongside each other. So here, these are the nerves that are bringing signals back. When they bring signal back, we did this discussion as well. Sensory nerves, when they bring this, this signal, these have to form a ganglion. So this is such a funny thing. Sensory nerve ganglion is like this. Imagine this is a nerve cell body and it has dendr dendrites. Dendrites are the areas on the nerve through which signals are given to the nerve. Then we know that there is a long, single, big wire. We call this axon. And axon takes the impulses or signals outwards. Exxon can bring the signal towards this area as well, but mostly they take the signal out and the signals usually arrive at dendroid from other axons. Now, here, when the nerve is going back towards the brain, 
this nerve cell body usually it is so funny what it does is when we are developing somehow these sensory nerves do this here is the nerve cell body the two poles the axon and dendroid they start moving towards each other they continue to move towards each other to the point till the point that they really come very close to each other when when they come very close to each other this looks like this thing looks like a nerve cell body just sitting there and we think it's a ganglion we used to think these are ganglions these are collection of the nerve cell bodies these are actually ganglions however they are not relay centers that is it's not that a nerve is ending there and the other nerve is starting these are called pseudo unipolar ganglions pseudo means false unipolar means it has a single pole but that pole is actually made up of two poles axon and dendrite anyways it's an interesting thing that there is this ganglion called inferior ganglion all fibers or majority of the fibers they come and they relay they, they don't relay there the ganglion is present i just explained they don't relay there and then i'm saying they relay there and then from there finally the fibers go and end here in the solitary nucleus so this nucleus here is called the solitary nucleus so what are these fibers bringing they are bringing messages from various parts of our viscera for the situation there temperature or or the movement or the or the uh, nerve or the stretch of the viscera's and so on now same thing from from the whole system sensation is brought back that sensation is then processed by a brain and then the motor activity or secretory activity is sent back so this is the general visceral efferent general things from the viscera pain sensation stretch sensation movement sensation we usually are not aware until the pain is too much so here is an example of how vagus helps combine sensory and motor activity to create a reflex which is let's say this this reflex i especially made it for heart rate because that is an important one so imagine this whole structure is a heart so here is if i complete this heart this is a structure of the heart and this is aorta coming out of it this is superior vena cava inferior vena cava or the inlets of the blood and this is the outlet now inside the aorta the largest blood vessel that is coming out of the heart left ventricle we have two kinds of receptors one are stretch receptors that are checking the pressure in the aorta there are also chemo receptors here that would check the ph of the aorta or the blood in the aorta so let's not talk about the ph for the time being let's just talk about the pressure so as our heart pushes blood in aorta aorta swells up or or inflates with that blood in it and it dilates like a balloon and then it slowly squeezes that blood and moves it out that is the function of aorta when the aorta is dilating under the pressure of and volume of the blood the stretch receptors start firing those stretch receptors bring or their signals from them are brought to the brain through vagus nerve so that is general visceral efferent so here is that one there is a pseudo unipolar nucleus and finally the nerve ends in solitary nucleus i have now brought these nuclei of the these three out there separately so here solitary nucleus receives the stretch from our aorta 
that tells a solitary nucleus in the medulla oblongata that here is the pressure in our uh, aorta that would also translate as pressure in the rest of the body. Now, the, this is a sensory part. Our body now has to respond. And do you know it is responding all the time? It is not that your blood pressure is 120, 80 and so body is not doing anything. It is trying to maintain it at that. If it goes up, it tries to keep it down to 120. If it goes down, it tries to bring it up. And all the time blood pressure is fluctuating and body is just running around, fixing it. So how is it running around? This is that run around. So from the aorta, impulse comes to the solitary nucleus. From the solitary nucleus, then the motor components are activated. So here you can see this is the dorsal nucleus of vagus and this is the nucleus ambiguous. So from solitary nucleus, short circuits connect the incoming impulse back into the motor area. So when motor nuclei are now stimulated, they are going to send impulses towards the heart. The sensory part brought the impulses signal and then the motor part bring the messages to the heart. Now what is the message? If blood pressure is high, then the vagus would start acting, increasing its firing and it would tell our SA node to slow down. So our body will have our heart rate reduced. On the other hand, if the blood pressure starts going down, then this signal frequency would change. That would mean that, oh man, we have a low blood pressure. And when that happens, Vegas is asked not to suppress the SA node. Remember, Vegas normally suppresses the SA node to keep the heart rate low. So we, we tell Vegas to say, slow down. Don't suppress the heart too much now. We need the heart to work more. We need the blood pressure to go up. So Vegas would reduce its suppressing activity and heart rate would go up a little bit under disinhibition from the Vegas. And we start developing a higher heart rate and better blood pressure. If that is not sufficient, then our flight and fright system, the sympathetic system is going to kick in. And that's going to actually actively increase the heart rate and produce adrenaline and noradrenaline. And that's going to increase the force of con contraction and velocity of conduction and the cardiac cycle or the uh, heart rate itself. So all activities of heart will be then further augmented by sympathetic. But day-to-day -day or minute-to-minute -minute or second-to-second -second fluctuations are mostly just a balance in sympathetic and parasympathetic and this is the parasympathetic arch reflex arch that we are seeing and of course we're not aware of it it's just happening now remember this that glossopharyngeal nerve it's not very important to keep that in our mind but just like aorta has stretch receptors in it and chemo receptors in it the bifurcation of the blood vessels that are going towards our brain near this jaw, they also have pressure and chemoreceptors there as well. Our body is very, very careful for what goes to our brain, blood and otherwise as well. So glossopharyngeal is another cranial nerve that takes the messages from this bifurcation, we call that carotid body and carotid sinus, and brings that to the brain. So that is why they note here that the blood pressure maintenance is not just the vagus nerve's behavior, it is also helped by glossopharyngeal as well. Now, can vagus do other reflexes as well? Yes, and please look at those reflexes in context of if vagus or the parasympathetic system is misfiring, what are the things we might start experiencing? So check this out. Peristalsis, that is the movement of stomach and intestine, is a reflex control. So if the parasympathetic system with the vagus nerve is somehow misfiring, our stomach movement and intestine movement can become incorrect. 
which would mean we might develop diarrhea, we might develop vomiting, we might develop nausea, we might develop constipation. It depends what has been done to the GIT. Have we increased the motility? Then diarrhea vomiting would occur. Have we increased the secretions? Diarrhea vomiting fluidity would increase. Have we reduced the motility? Constipation would occur. Have we reversed the motility? Nausea would occur. So it really depends what is being done. But whatever is being done can actually be felt by us. Plus, we would actually see the signs of it in terms of diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, stomach pain, and so on. Gas. Gas would develop if the stomach is moving. Stomach, I was saying, intestine is moving less. That would make the food stagnate. And that would cause the gut microbiome to work more on the food and create more gas and will feel gassy. Gastric and bronchial secretions. So bronchial, the airway secretions, are under control of the parasympathetic system as well. Stomach secretions are under control of the vagus reflexes as well. So if they start becoming abnormal, our secretions in the airways and the stomach acids will start becoming abnormal. And they have their own signs and symptoms. This would also cause cough. So when the um, secretions in the airways would change, we would develop cough. So we might actually start thinking that this is just normal cough. But no, this cough is because of the vagal reflexes. It's not regular cough of irritation in the back of the throat. This is vagal abnormality causing cough. Similarly, lung lumen. Lumen is the, the inside of the cylinder of the airways. Those lumen or the um, space inside the airways might start changing, which would cause difficulty in breathing. So that is, the, that is an example of some of the reflexes that are maintained by vagus. And if vagus starts misfiring, these reflexes can start becoming abnormal. And we would just not know that this is vagus doing it. We just know, well, I'm coughing or I have this acidity or I'm feeling nauseated or I have diarrhea or I'm feeling gassy and so on. So this could be parasympathetic activity. And again, please don't self-diagnose uh, yourself. This has to go to a doctor. He has to actually see what is the cause of all of that. There are many reasons for nausea, many reasons for diarrhea, many reasons for acidity, many reasons for shortness of breath. So it's not always vagus or heart rate abnormalities, but parasympathetic system can contribute there as well. Okay, so now next part. Special visceral afferent. We had just saw, saw, we just saw general visceral afferent. So from the viscera, the message is coming back. Normal messages. Now we're going to look at special visceral afferent. This is special because this is the vagus nerve bringing messages to the brain stem about the pH of our blood. Our body is very, very clever, very, very sensitive for maintaining us. Too bad we can still become sick and pathogens can still attack us and kind of sometimes defeat us. However, body has sophisticated mechanisms. So here is another mechanism. That is, when we are not breathing correctly, or our lungs are damaged, or we are sleeping, and we are just naturally breathing with less uh, rhythm, with less frequency, what happens is our body's chemical system starts changing. We have less oxygen, we have more carbon dioxide, we start producing more acids, we have less pH. And so all of that is also measured. Our kidneys are measuring that. Our vagus nerve is measuring that glossopharyngeal system is measuring that. Every tissue individually is taking care of the acidity and the environment. So here we are, what we are seeing is 
imagine a person who is either breathing incorrectly or is not able to breathe correctly or has lung damage or has uh, blood issues whatever is the reason at the end of the day they have less oxygen more carbon dioxide and the ph of the blood has reduced or the blood has become slightly acidic when that happens so start back from here this is once again aorta the largest blood vessel coming out of the heart aorta has tiny chemical sensors in them attached with the vagus nerve these are called chemoreceptors this is why it is called special visceral if afferent this is a special case of chemoreceptors attached to a nerve we normally don't have them we don't have chemoreceptors attached to nerves everywhere but in this case and in the glossopharyngeal case we have chemoreceptors attached to a nerve this is why we call it special visceral afferent or sorry afferent so here are some chemoreceptors they are, they are present in wall of aorta aorta is a lab as the blood is coming out we're looking at the blood pressure we're looking at the composition of the blood pressure the acidity of the blood pressure oxygen levels carbon dioxide level we are checking what is coming out and then we are preparing body to fix if there is any abnormality what a sophisticated system so back here chemoreceptors are present they are looking at the ph that ph signal also is carried to the brain same nucleus solitary nucleus through the vagus same inferior ganglion as the sensory ganglion but here is a fun thing instead of the signals going all the way to the solitary nucleus these signals go to a rather <laughs> i'm going to say something that medical students and others would laugh wishy washy area why, why do i call it wishy washy area this is called reticular formation reticular formation is an area in the brain where the cell bodies that is gray matter and the nerves nerve fibers that is white matter they kind of intertwine with each other and mix and mingle with each other that it doesn't look white it doesn't look gray it looks reticular it looks dotty so call it wishy washy it's neither <laughs> neither of them it's a lot of white fibers passing through there and mixed between or scattered between them are cell bodies so when you look at that under the microscope it looks reticular reticular means uh, white and black and white and black dotty pattern so near the solitary nucleus is some reticular formation these fibers from the chemoreceptors which are special visceral efferents of the vagus nerve they end there in the reticular formation not in the solitary nucleus itself now they finish there and they help the system to know what is the chemical composition of the blood and then the body can react to that by increasing our breathing or um, changing our heart rates and so on breathing rate and uh, trying to fix that and in the long run kidneys would get involved and they would start uh, main maintaining the acid base balance and so on it's, it's a more complex system vagus has has done its part then then the second part you would love this one and this is the second last thing we are almost done taste now vagus is a visceral thing why is it concerned with the taste it is it has something to do with the taste and it has something to do with the sensory system of the back of the ear and the tympanic membrane outside and the auditory canal so let's look at taste somatic visceral sorry special visceral afferent taste from epiglottis epiglottis is a valve like thing here leaf like structure here when we eat food it kind of makes sure that the food goes in esophagus and not in the trachea so it closes the trachea now this epigl epiglottis so we would think that well the taste is really by the tongue no epiglottis that little leaf like structure has cells on it for taste and taste from there 
is carried towards the brain through vagus nerve. So vagus nerve can actually participate in taste or distaste if vagus nerve is not functioning correctly. Similarly, on the back of the throat, if I, if I insert this pen all the way and go touch the back of the throat, the back posterior wall of the pharynx, there are taste fibers there as well. And they are also going to carry their signal on vagus nerve. So this black one is the taste fibers from epiglottis and posterior wall of the pharynx. Those fibers also go through the inferior ganglion to what we say caudal part of the solitary nucleus. So cranial part means upper part and caudal part means lower part. So lower part of this nucleus receives the vagus taste. It's not the major taste. The major taste is coming from the tongue. It's just ancillary, accessory taste. And that is coming to the caudal part of the solitary nucleus. From there, now remember, taste is not a subconscious feeling. It is actually something that we can appreciate. So Vegas's job now is to bring this taste all the way to the brain. It cannot just leave this one over there to say, all right, now this is the blood pressure. And body without you appreciating that goes ahead and manages it. Here it is taste. So how does the next step occur? Once the taste message arrives in the caudal part or lower part of the solitary nucleus, then from there, the fibers go up to the thalamus, especially in the ventral postromedial nucleus. So for the non-medical, ignore it, goes to thalamus. From the thalamus, it goes to the sensory system in the post-central gyrus or the somatosensory area of the brain. That is where then we would appreciate the taste. The whole circuit of taste attached to vagus. Very interesting. So special visceral afferent, what are the two parts of that? Taste, which we can appreciate. And the second part is the chemical composition of the blood, which we cannot appreciate. And the last part, general somatic efferent. So once again, efferent means fibers are bringing messages from the body or periphery towards the brain. General somatic means from the body in general. So these are the sensations that we can feel. These are pain, temperature, pressure, touch, pressure, or touch, or tactile. So if I touch on the back of my ear, or if I touch in the ear canal, or if I have a Q-tip that goes all the way to the tympanic membrane, that would be painful and kind of touches that. Those all the sensations are carried with vagus. This is why we actually have a, uh, we say that don't irritate the vagus over here accidentally, because vagus can then create an outburst in the remaining body if you irritate it here. So what is it that it is doing? Back of the ear and external auditory canal. So this is the back of the ear. Then this is the external auditory canal. So this is the hole that we can see from outside. And then the tympanic membrane or the eardrums out of sight, that all has part of those sensations are carried by vagus. Do you know this? Uh, so over here, there is, uh, when I, studied this for the first time when I was doing medicine second year physiology and I read that the hearing is a sense of touch. At that time my mind was blown. I always thought hearing is a special sense and a different type of a sense. But really at the end of the day, air compressed and dilated air moves into our ear canal and goes and touches the tympanic membrane and moves it. And that is what causes the perception of audio or voice. So it is actually a sense of touch. And of course, Vegas is 
involved in that. In addition to this, in the posterior cranial fossa, so if you see me, this back part of the skull and the brain inside and the covering of the brain, that is the, the dura matter of the posterior cranial fossa. That dura matter's sens sensory uh, signals are also carried on vagus. So malfunctioning vagus could actually create paresthesias or sense of touch or pain temperature in these areas, even including dura, which could not be pain temperature in those, but could act as pain in the back. And again, the, the whole connection is the same. We go to the this one for medicals, please, for medical students, nursing students. Please remember that the nucleus that is taking part in, in this is actually not vagus nucleus. The fibers are vagus. They're riding on the vagus nerve. But the nucleus is trigeminal nucleus. And the sensory ganglion is superior jugular ganglion, not inferior. This is the only part of vagus that is so weird. So these fibers are actually trigeminal. From there, then they go to the ventral postromedial nucleus of thalamus. From there, they go to brain. And then brain does the perception part of touching and feeling. And final part. From epiglottis and larynx, you can also get sensation through vagus. So that is vagus. <laughs> this is the most <laughs> complex cranial nerve. I salute you if you stayed and if you are not from medical field and if you actually watched this all. The important thing why I did this, for medical students and nursing students, this is an important one. They have to learn this, so it's good for them. For the rest of us, it is important as we are building our foundation for autonomic nervous system. This is an, a major part of the autonomic nervous system, the relay system. And any abnormality in ANS because of long COVID will be then seen in the context of these signs and symptoms. So thank you very much. I know it was a little nerdy. For medical students, it's not even a question of nerdy. Medical nursing students, they have to do it. So I hope this was easy for them to capture. For non-medicine, this may be nerdy. But again, if we don't understand the normal function, we cannot understand abnormal function, and then we cannot understand how to manage it. You can understand this, that if you understand this physiology, then you can understand the pathology, which we'll do in the coming days, then automatically you will know how to start managing it. That is good medicine. Not, here is Vegas, it misfired, go to a doctor, and <laughs> something will happen. So with this, thank you very much. I would skip on the chit chat today because tomorrow we have a talk at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Tomorrow we don't have a talk in the evening. We have it in the morning at 9 o'clock. We would have Dr. Giles Yeo with us. Dr. Giles is such an enormous personality. And he is a top personality of the, you know, appetite and hunger and satiety and uh, calories and what to eat and what not to eat and the wrong perceptions about calories and he has books written and he's in Cambridge and he has very graciously um, uh, said that he would join us. So tomorrow at nine o'clock he would join us. My hope is tomorrow we'll ask him about his work and ask him some questions and then we would request him to continue to come back and discuss more about nutrition with us. So with this, thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, and share. In this video, in the description, there is a special link for discount for Dr. Bean. I always fight me with my team. The price is so low that just one video in other sites is actually more expensive than the whole set. So if you would like to take advantage of that, please use that link. That's one. There are links as well if you would like to buy me a coffee or use PayPal or use Patreon. 
to support this work. Thank you very much. And I would see you tomorrow, 9 a.m. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye.